All right, welcome everyone uh, to this week's iteration of the Online Peace Science Colloquium. I'm, uh, I'm this week's host. My name is Brad Smith. I'm an assistant professor at Vanderbilt University, and uh, I run this colloquium along with my Vanderbilt colleague, Kathy Dorf. So if this is your first time tuning in, um, I'll tell you a little bit about the colloquium. So we're associated with uh, the Peace Science Society International, and our goal is to bring the great research that happens before and after each year's annual meeting of the society uh, to you all and to expand the audience and uh, continue to sort of you know, provide comments and help make that research better and uh, widen the audience that, that, gets, that gets to see, gets to see that, that kind of research. Um, so this week, uh, we have a great, really great paper that I'm excited to discuss. Uh, it's called Make Two Democracies and Call Me in the Morning, Endogenous Regime Type and the Democratic Peace. Uh, Dinah Chiba is going to be presenting it, and this is co-authored work with Eric Gartsky, who is also joining us today. Um, we have a great uh, panel of discussants to offer feedback on the paper. We have Jeff Carter from Appalachian State University, Florian Hollenbach, who's at Texas A&M, Gabriel Leon at King's College London, and Andrew Altiak at University of Georgia. Um, so with that, we'll get started. Ground rules are simple. We've got, um, we're going to have a 15 minute uh, presentation from, from Dinah, and then we'll use the remaining 45 minutes of our time slot to first take some, take some general comments from the panelists, and then we'll just have a discussion and uh, try to get as much feedback in as possible. If you're watching live, you can submit uh, comments. Uh, and even if we if we have time at the end, we may uh, offer them to the authors. But if not, definitely offer your comments uh, in the chat, and we'll share them with the authors after after the session. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dinah. If you could share your screen, and we're looking what? forward to the presentation. Right. Uh, share screen. How did I, uh... are you guys seeing my slides? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Oh, I, I'm not seeing my slides. Uh, Okay, all right. Um, right. Uh, thank you very much, Brad and, and Cassie for organizing this workshop series and for uh, giving Eric and I uh, uh, an opportunity to present our work. I'd like to uh, also thank uh, a group of uh, awesome discussants for taking the time to read the, uh, the paper and, and comment, um, especially in a, in a time like this. Uh, so I'm really excited to present uh, the paper titled Make Two Democracies and Call Me in the Morning. Uh, which is a joint work with Eric Gartsky. Um, so, ooh, I was, right. So pretty much um, everyone who is watching this probably knows that there is a wide consensus among IR scholars uh, about the existence of a correlation between regime type and, and war. That uh, pairs of democracies uh, rarely, if ever, fight wars with each other. But uh, when it comes to interpreting this, this observed relationship, there is a massive disagreement among, among scholars, right? So one group of scholars say this is a straightforward causal relationship where democracy causes peace. Another group of scholars say that the causal arrow goes the other way around. Uh, and uh, yet another group of scholars say that this is a spurious correlation caused by a third variable uh, uh, causing both. So what we have is that uh, there are uh, so many plausible and credible theories uh, <clears throat> that are proposed to explain the same phenomena, but we don't have um, as many credible empirical tests of these multiple theories that are proposed to explain the democratic peace. Right, so, um, but uh, devising a credible empirical test of these multiple theories using observational data um, has been challenging because of the concerns of uh, endogeneity. Um, there, has always, there is always a danger that we end up uh, with uh, either too many control variables or too few control variables, right? So 
um, some scholars have thus turned to uh, experimental methods uh, to make causal inference. But uh, because uh, conducting randomized control trial on, on war and peace is, uh, is, is not feasible or, or not ethical, um, scholars have tried to um, test a part of a theory by focusing on, for example, uh, the effect of regime type on, uh, on some intermediate outcomes, such as uh, uh, the effect of regime type on public support for war, rather than the effect of regime type on the final outcome, war and peace. So what we are trying to do here is to try to combine the strengths of both uh, of these approaches and, um, and using observational data um, and, and use um, a quasi-experimental approach, uh, instrumental variables approach uh, to be more specific um, and, and make a causal inference behind the democratic piece. And we report a findings that democracies appear to uh, actually increase conflict initiation. So since we're using an instrumental variable approach, we obviously need a plausible instrument, right? In order to identify the, uh, the causal effect of democracy, <clears throat> right? Uh, an instrument that is uh, uh, strongly correlated with democracy, but is plausibly exogenous to international conflict. And we argue that um, <clears throat> a country's average fertility rate measured as the number of childbirth per woman uh, can, can serve as a plausible instrument in, in our study. But in order to convince you that this is a valid instrument, we need to establish uh, the two things. Uh, first, we need to establish uh, the relevance of this instrument, that we need to show that fertility rate um, and democracy are uh, at least correlated with each other. And, and for that purpose, um, we show uh, theoretically, we argue that a decline in fertility rate Leads uh, uh, would mean that it will free up a lot of time and resources of, of women who can then invest their time and energy on um, social, economic, and political activities, uh, which will lead to uh, um, <clears throat> um, female empowerment and, and enhanced um, equality between, between gender, which is already a part of the definition of democracy. But also uh, there has been some um, anecdotal or qualitative evidence that suggests that a group of women played a significant role in bringing about democracy in democratic uh, democratization movement in countries such as uh, Indonesia. And we also have uh, quantitative support for, for this, this relationship. Perhaps a, a more challenging thing to establish is the exclusion restriction, that fertility rate is not directly related to international conflict. So uh, in order to, to demonstrate this, we're gonna uh, perform a series of falsification tests uh, that we, we're gonna come back to later in the presentation. First, uh, let's talk about the relevance of this instrument. So um, there are, are, are many countries that have always been democratic and have always had low fertility rate throughout the observation period between 1960 and 2010. And there have always uh, th there have been uh, countries that have always been non-democratic and have high fertility rate uh, during the same period. But for the purpose of um, illustrating this causal mechanism between these two, perhaps it would be more helpful to look at um, countries that have experienced some transitions, right? So uh, th this graph shows uh, a sample of uh, representative sample of countries that have experienced some transition. Right? So these are the countries that have. Uh, that started out being non-democratic and have a uh, high fertility rate. And these countries experienced a sizable decline in fertility rate. And, and then these countries experienced a transition from non-democracy to democracy, right? Um, and also um, to systematically investigate this relationship between, between these two, um, the, this table shows uh, so-called first stage estimates where we regressed democracy on fertility rate, along with um, uh, control variables that have uh, been proposed to, uh, to explain fertility rate, <clears throat> right? So, and, and we can see that fertility rate has a negative impact on, on democracy, even after controlling for uh, some determinants of fertility rate and, and democracy. Now we're gonna move on to the main results. So this figure shows um, <clears throat> uh, the, the main findings. First, we, we, uh, we show the, uh, the, our baseline findings. 
where um, <clears throat> when we when we ignore indigeneity uh, um, of democracy, the uh, the effect of joint democracy on conflict is is negative. So uh, what's shown here are the change in predicted probability of conflict when we change the value of regime type from uh, non-democracy to democracy for a challenger, holding constant the value of regime type for the target as democracy. And we do the same for, for the target. So what we can see here is that when we ignore indigeneity, um, <clears throat> we, would, uh, we would find a negative uh, effect of regime type on, on conflict. But once we uh, correct for this indigeneity problem, the effect uh, becomes positive and it, uh, the effect is uh, statistically significant for uh, the challenger, uh, which suggests that democracy actually makes it more likely for a challenger country to initiate a conflict against, uh, against democracies. Right? But these uh, results, of course, critically depend on our, our identification assumption. Um, <clears throat> to be more specific, the exclusion restriction assumption that fertility rate uh, influences peace only exclusively through democracy. Um, <clears throat> so if a fertility rate has a direct impact on peace, then uh, that would violate this exclusion restriction assumption. Unfortunately, this assumption cannot be verified em empirically, even if it's true. But fortunately, it could be falsified if this assumption is false. So what are we going to do um, in this paper is to run uh, three, a set of three falsification tests um, <clears throat> that uh, allows us to assess the plausibility of this assumption. Uh, but in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, just the first um, of such falsification tests in this presentation. Right. So. Um, there have been some uh, pioneering work um, <clears throat> led by, by Caplioli that actually looked at the relationship between gender-related variables and international conflict. And Caplioli um, <clears throat> found that um, there is a positive relationship between fertility rate and conflict, meaning that a decline in fertility rate is pacifying. Um, and, and a follow-up study of, of, of uh, Caprioli um, also claimed a positive relationship, but they actually uh, found a negative relationship. But the, um, <clears throat> yeah, so there, there is some concern that the fertility rate might influence conflict. So um, what we claim um, against these, uh, these studies is, is that fertility rate may affect conflict, but they do so only via inducing democratization first. So in order to um, assess the plausibility of, of our claim, let's first um, explore the theoretical mechanism behind these, these studies. Right, so these studies begin with the assumption that women in general have more peaceful preference than, than men. <clears throat> and um, they also argue that lower fertility rate will lead to female empowerment, just like we, we do, just like we argue. And these studies argue that uh, female empowerment would mean that uh, women's preference, uh, <coughs> preferences will be more likely to be reflected in politics or foreign policy decision making, which will then lead to um, the outcome, peace or, or, or conflict. So um, of these three key points, um, we agree with point A and, and uh, you know, the first two points. We agree that uh, women may have uh, more peaceful preferences. Uh, there, has been, uh, there have been uh, many experimental studies that uh, demonstrate to that, this effect. We also agree that the lower fertility rate will lead to female empowerment, but um, um, <clears throat> we disagree with the previous studies in, in, in the sense that uh, we argue that the process C necessarily involves democratization for, uh, for two main reasons. First, female empowerment will lead to um, <clears throat> greater equality between gender, uh, which is already a part of uh, the definitions of democracy. And second, uh, in order for women's preferences to be reflected in foreign policy, there has to be some mechanism that guarantees a, a translation of preferences into, into policy outcomes. For example, democracy, right? So it requires democracy for 
women's preferences to be reflected in, in, in policy. So what we have to ask here is in the absence of democracy, can this happen, right? So is there any other ways that brings about women's preferences into foreign policy? And we think that maybe that having a female leader might open up a possibility that female preferences, women's preferences are going to be reflected in politics in the absence of, of democracy, right? So if that's the case, if fertility, declining fertility rate leads to female empowerment, which leads to a higher enhanced chance that a country has female leader, which may then influence the final outcome, then our exclusion restriction will be violated. There is, a, there is gonna be a backdoor path that connects fertility rate uh, and peace without going through democracy, right? However, um, if fertility rate, rate in influences the likelihood that a, a country has female leader through democracy, right? If the effect goes through democracy, then, uh, and if there is no direct relationship between fertility rate and female leader, then the exclusion restriction is still, still holds. Right, so this is what we, uh, uh, we, we're gonna test. Right, so uh, the ta this table shows the, the result of aggression models where the dependent variable is a binary variable measuring whether or not a country year has a female leader. And um, <clears throat> the first model includes uh, fertility rate along with uh, control variables. Second model includes democracy. Third model includes both. It shows that fertility rate uh, appears to have no direct impact on uh, whether or not country has a female leader, uh, whereas uh, democracy has a strong impact on, on that. So it seems that fertility rate will impact female leader, but only through democracy. Right, so um, to wrap up, uh, we report findings that a joint democracy does not have a pacifying effect. Uh, in, in fact, uh, democracy appears to increase the conflict initiation. Uh, this calls for a reevaluation of a lot of these theories that have been proposed to explain the observed pattern. Uh, but one caveat uh, is in order. So the effect that we uh, we are reporting here is uh, is late. It's, it's local average treatment effect, which would not be the same as uh, average treatment effect. Right. So the effect that we are teasing out is the effect of democracy that is uh, correlated with, uh, with um, <clears throat> our instrument, right? So, uh, which means that it is possible that um, uh, we find something, uh, you know, a different effect if we use um, different instrument. So we, we encourage other scholars to, um, to adapt our framework and, um, you know, possibly use um, um, other instruments to, to try to estimate the effect of, of democracy. Uh, so that we can we can get closer to uh, to the truth. Um, so this is this is late, but um, um, as um, <clears throat> as a famous adage say, uh, you know, better better late than than nothing, right? Better uh, um, <clears throat> late is the best we can hope for. So um, I guess I guess with, with that we we conclude, and um, I look forward to uh, to the comments. All right, thanks, Dinah. Um, let's see if you could Stop unshare sharing. your screen. Awesome, looks like we're back. And so, um, one minute, let me drag things around here on my end. Okay, um, so I think now we'll we'll turn it over we'll turn it over to the panel. Um, and just to kind of make sure that we can get as many comments as possible, let's run through and let. Um, let each of the discussants kind of hit the high points uh, of your thoughts. So we'll we'll start with Jeff, um, and then uh, we'll we'll go through and let Florian, Gabriel, and Andrew uh, add their add their thoughts in that order. And then once once we've kind of collected those those comments, we'll give Dinah a chance to respond, and then we can have a conversation um, with, about the paper with with the time that we have left. So Jeff, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thanks, Brad. Um, I really first off, I really enjoyed the paper. Um, it's for what it's worth, when I started reading it, I found myself thinking like, 
I've always thought about the democratic piece. Basically, yeah, I buy the correlation, but I've always assumed that kind of non-random selection and endogeneity is kind of what a lot of those estimates are actually picking up. And so I think it's kind of, I'm on board with what you're doing, both kind of substantively and methodologically. I think it makes sense to try to model where the democracies come from kind of jointly with um, the effect of democracy on peace. Um, when I was reading the paper though, and kind of coming up with comments, um, my approach was to think about what like the modal reviewer would um, say about this versus what I think about it. And um, one of the things that I've, I kept coming back to was I think that a lot of aspects of your modeling approach um, kind of move away from what the kind of standard democratic peace model looks like. And I think this is one of those things where each individual decision makes sense, um, but it's not, I worry that you've moved too far away from kind of the models that underlie kind of the modal reviewers understanding of the democratic piece. Um, and so the, I just wanna hit on a couple of big points. I've got more, um, detailed comments that I'll send you um, in the next couple of days when I finish writing them up. But the kind of big ones that jump out to me were first, right, you move from a non-directed diet setup to a directed diet setup. I understand why you do that in terms of aggregating these monadic characteristics up to a non-directed kind of setup. But, you know, I think the kind of canonical democratic piece regression is non-directed diets, right? Along with that, you've got the discussion of kind of the specifications. And you're right, you're trying to kind of balance dealing with omitted variable bias versus the um, post-treatment kind of bias. But I, my gut feeling is that the average interstate conflict quantitative scholar that buys the democratic piece is thinking about like the O'Neill and Russet specifications, right? And the kind of last kind of big picture thing along these lines is your sample is just contiguous dyads. And um, as you kind of point out in a footnote, right? And based on some of your, like your paper with Bill Reed, Dinah, right? You know, you find that, you know, contiguous dyads look different than non-contiguous dyads. And so you might think about kind of moving to politically relevant dyads or all dyads. I understand your point that, you know, when you get to an all dyad specification, you've got countries that don't have much of a chance to get involved in the conflict. But when I was uh, reading your paper, I went back and write, Scott Bennett has this 2006 piece in CMPS where he talks about different operationalizations. And when, you, when you're just using kind of directly contiguous pairs of states, depending on how you define direct contiguity, it either gets you somewhere between 50.3% of mid onsets or 63%. So you're still leaving out a lot of conflicts by just focusing on those kind of directly um, contiguous pairs of countries. So I've got a lot of more kind of specific points um, that I'll share with you, but I don't wanna take too much time since we have too many panelists. But I think big picture, the, th the more you can do to kind of move your specifications closer to kind of what the average democratic peace model looks like, that's probably the better for getting it through the review process. Thank you. Right, thanks, Jeff. Uh, we'll just keep collecting comments here at the beginning. So Florian, if you want to jump in. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you both for, for the paper. I think it was really exciting, interesting to read and exciting. Um, so I'm less into the like full IR literature um, and my comments are more methodological. Uh, so I, I'm i very, uh, favorable to towards your results so so the don't take my comments as as i don't want to believe your results um but i'm gonna try to kind of give you you know as much trying to poke holes into this as, as i can and then you can try to uh, uh fill them back up with mortar <laughs> um so the i still have a hard time believing the instrument to be honest and the 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 main thing is um, you do the falsification tests and and all those um, and as they are, I think they're 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 really nice. But the the big thing that that bothers me a little bit is 
that all of these regressions, including the falsific, I think including all the ones that you do in the falsification test also include infant, infant mortality, right? And so infant mortality and fertility are super highly related, right? Because, um, you know, if, if lots of babies are dying early, women, we have more babies. Um, and so like, if you think of the, the replacement rate, right? In, in countries with low infant mortality, the replacement rate in terms of fertility rate is like 2.1, I think, or 2.3. Um, and in countries with high, high infant mortality, it's like three point something, right? And so given that these two variables are so closely related to each other, um, I have a hard time thinking about what does fertility rate mean without, with when we partial out the effect of infant mortality. Uh, and that affects then the instrument strength, right? Which, um, I mean, it's significant, but I think we need more information about like what, um, just because it's significant doesn't mean it's a very strong predictor of, of um, the outcomes, right? Given that you control for infant mortality. Uh, and then just in terms of the falsification test, I just wonder like if you take out infant mortality I'm imagining the, the, the coefficients on fertility rate in those fal falsification tests might change. And I would definitely want to see that. Um, that would make it a little bit easier uh, to believe. But, and then just the, the biggest thing to me is kind of this reverse causality between conflict and uh, fertility rate, right? So I would think that there, that there has to, in, in my view, just from like intuition there, I would expect that there's some relationship between those two variables, just, you know, if there is conflict, then, then people have, uh, I mean, I, I would imagine that impacts fertility. Um, I'll send you a bunch of other smaller comments or uh, if we get to it later. One thing just in terms of language that I, as somebody who's working a bunch of instrumental variable papers, um, you often say that the exclusion restriction in terms of there must not be a direct effect of fertility on conflict, but that's not really precisely what the exclusion restriction is, right? It, it doesn't matter whether it's a direct effect or not. We just need right. the covariance right. yeah. between the errors and the, and the yeah. instrument to be zero. Um, so I would just be a, uh, a little more careful in terms of language there, but I'll stop here and then we can get to more or, or I'll send you other stuff. All right, thanks Florian. Uh, we'll jump over to Gabriel now. Okay, thanks. I, I thought this paper was great, actually. I thought it was very impressive. And I set out to sort of make a list of, you know, criticisms in, in the spirit of, of being constructive. But I thought, well, let's, let's pretend that I'm a very tough reviewer. What can I come up with? And I, and I struggled a bit, I think, because the paper is, is so polished and so well executed. But I, I think I have sort of three general comments. Uh, the first one is the the relationship you find is actually very interesting, but it got me thinking about what could be kind of the theoretical mechanism that is explaining the new result that you find. And I couldn't really find very much in the paper that tried to explain that. And I know that that's not the purpose of the paper in the sense that you basically set out this sort of standard finding and then you see that the standard finding is, is not robust, but it, it does kind of raise the question, okay, so the finding that you find is quite different, but what can explain that? And sort of related to that point, I think, so you mentioned late, and the late comes quite late in the paper as well. And the late, I think, almost gives you an opportunity to discuss some of the mechanism or story that might be behind the relationship uh, that you find. And, I, and I, I, I wonder whether that's one of the things that some reviewers might sort of wonder, okay, so what's going on here? What can explain this new relationship? Uh, the other thing that I kind of wonder a little bit about was uh, fertility rate. And, and I I feel actually, in a way, for me, I found it relatively convincing. But I thought I wanted to know a little bit more about it. And in particular, because fertility rate seems to be something that would have an effect on democracy, say, 20 or 30 years later. So there's kind of a considerable lag. And understanding how, well, first, how we think that works in practice and then how that's in incorporated into the model, I think would be quite useful. I think doing that as well would allow you to address some of the potential criticisms of the exclusion restriction. So I was thinking of, I mean, it's, I think it's always possible to think of, of violations of the exclusion restriction. 
Uh, and I think it's sometimes unfair that people spend so much time trying to find holes in the exclusion restriction. But I think one possibility here is that you just basically have more people. And if you have more young people, then it's relatively cheaper for you to fight wars. First, because, well, you know, you have more people, maybe you can sort of take from the street and send them to fight. Um, but at the same time, because you can actually send a substantial fraction of your young population to war without slowing down, you know, the core produ productive capacity of the state. And then that starts getting conflated then with economic conditions and so on. And in, in a way, I, I think sort of, sort of in a nutshell, I, I think you could spend a little more time kind of explaining in detail why you expect that relationship uh, to be there. So how, how do you expect fertility to affect democracy? And the, the last point, sort of very brief, but kind of related to how you kind of set it up the problem. I think you do a very good job of explaining how omitted variables could be having an effect on the relationship that people typically find. But what I was a little bit confused about was this uh, focus on basically the intermediate variables. And at some point, I thought you were saying that you were interested in only estimating the causal relationship that was direct from democracy towards conflict, which I thought was a bit odd because we normally think that democracy would be affecting conflict through a number of different possible mechanisms. So I wonder in a way whether you were focusing too much on, on that issue to, to your potential detriment. Again, kind of maybe you were uh, providing referees who are keen to be critical with things they can be critical about. Great, 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 great paper. I, I thought it was very polished. And if I'd been a reviewer, I think I would have been very keen to accept it. Thanks, Gabriel. All right, uh, let's jump over to Andy. Well, thank you for the opportunity to, to look at this. Um, I'm going to do the same thing that everybody else has done and look at this really from the perspective of a critical reviewer. Um, and I've got a few points. The first one is the exclusion restriction. So one of the pathways that I see that could potentially um, this could potentially not work, right, is at one point the paper will say that the fertility rate, changes in the fertility rate change economic security and are, of course, also related to human rights, right? That raises the possibility that there are grievances, that civil conflict results, and that MIDs result from the civil conflict. Dino Gertz and I have looked at each of the MID narratives over the, the last uh, 110 years and about a third of the mids connect to civil conflict. So if this pathway is significant, it could potentially affect the results that you're seeing. The second thing is that the democratic peace folks will definitely say that their theory applies to non-contiguous dyads. I have experience in this area. They have hit me on this numerous times when I've published on this topic, right? Um, the Appendix A5 starts to get at that a little bit, but it really won't go far enough. And if it goes to a democratic peace reviewer, they will 100% say that you've mischaracterized the, the, the extent of their argument and that, well, you might be right in certain cases, we don't know that it necessarily changes the entire democratic peace finding. The third thing I think that's gonna come up is what, what sort of my initial impression was when I began reading it, which is what is the contribution? Um, and I know that sounds weird, right? But I think the paper sort of pitches right now this idea that um, we're just now learning that this is a spurious relationship, when in fact, of course, we know that there have been studies going back 13 years now that have found that repeatedly through a variety of instruments. So really, I think the challenge here is, you know, you're finding something old, but with a better model. And I don't know how to pitch that contribution in a way that reviewers will find compelling, it, it, you know, in a, in a particular outlet, right? I mean, they, they'll, they'll say, well, we you reconfirmed what we know. And, and I wanna maybe push you to think about how you can frame it so that they don't go down that road. For example, we have research on the fact that democratization leads to peace. Both Gibbler and I have worked on that, that topic. Um, so that's not a new thing either. And I'm trying to kind of dig for what that is. It's also, I don't think true that we don't know which way the causal arrow runs, which is kind of the way the conclusion discusses things. We have a fair amount of research looking at the timing of different things that would say, you know, territory comes before democracy. And so if territorial issues are driving this, then it's through democracy and the territorial will be the, the first moving variable. The same with, if you look at Mousseau's work on contract intensive economies, 
democracy happens almost always before a contract intensive economy. So what he's picking up is something that is a subset of democracies, right? So teasing out the temporal aspect of things, we do have a sense of which way the causal arrows could run. Um, I don't think it's right to say that we don't have uh, a sense of which way they do run, and especially because you use the same temporal logic to defend your fertility argument, right? Fertility changes happen first, then democracy, then peace, right? So I think if you're going to go down that road, you might have to explore some of this other research that, that has taken those arrows seriously. And then finally, I think the modeling and the results um, need more explanation and more discussion, especially, you know, someone had said this, this deviates from the democratic peace thing. I'm someone very familiar with this, and I found the results in the discussion very difficult to follow at times, um, and had to go back and reread sometimes two, three, four times. And you could perhaps chalk that up to, uh, I'm not the brightest bulb on the tree, and that's probably a fair assessment. Um, but I think when a reviewer gets it, if they're skeptical at the outset, um, if they can't follow it, they, they, might, they might not take the time to go, go further in depth. So those are my big points, and um, I look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Andy. Um, before before we uh, turn it over for a response, I, I had a couple of small thoughts to to throw in. Um, I think sort of sort of on the same um, on the same line of thinking that that Andy was was bringing up is that I feel like the the pitch could maybe be refined a bit, and I and I, I want to kind of pull on a string that Gabriel uh, brought up, which is that I think you bring up the local average treatment effect much too late in the paper. It seems quite defensive when you do. And it seems to me like one way to sort of refine the pitch would be to just acknowledge that up front and sort of make this, you know, make this pitch that, um, you know, there, there's this piece by Cyrus Sammy on causal empiricism in quantitative research. And I think the way he frames sort of this, you know, he, he sort of provides this way, you know, this causal empiricist like approach. And I feel like that might be a nice way to, to frame this paper, which is we know a lot of, you know, what he would in that paper call pseudo general pseudo facts about the democratic piece. And what you all are going to try to do is to be, you know, to sort of emphasize specificity over generality, right? And so you're trying to sort of drill down and, and take the causal question as seriously as you can with the data you have. Um, because when I read through, you know, at, at the beginning of the paper, I was, I was thinking, okay, well, what is the, what is the local treatment effect that we're getting? Because it may be interesting, right? I'm, I'm trying to think what kinds of states, you know, are compliers in this scenario. And you do this really nice thing later in the paper where you, you know, you sort of give some heuristics for, you know, of course we can't know who's a complier, but here, you know, here's some reasonable ideas about how we might identify them. And I, I, you know, personally wanted to know a lot about, well, which, which states are they, what do they look like? You know, how do they look different, similar? Um, so that may be something to consider um, when, when you're, you know, kind of thinking about how to, how to, you know, if, if you, if you go after this kind of reframing that, that Andy was mentioning. Anyway, um, Let's uh, let's turn it over to Dino. I'll give you and Eric a chance to respond, um, and then we've got about twenty minutes left. So I'll kind of let you two uh, guide the discussion because I want to make sure that you're, you're getting the kind of feedback that you need. Um, and I want to make sure that you know every, everything's addressed that you, you'd like to get feedback on. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you two. All right. Oh uh, well. First of all, thank you very much for for your thoughts, for comments. Um, uh, they, they're all well taken. Um, some of the comments uh, that you gave me are things that have been actually bothering us, Eric and me, and we've been thinking a lot about. Uh, but also some of the things are things that I've, I've never thought about. Um, <clears throat> so, um, for example, Jeff's uh, points uh, well taken that, you know, that this trade off between internal validity and external validity, you know, whether how much we should make our, our models look more like the previous, uh, the conventional models. Um, <clears throat> I mean, uh, we may maybe we should try uh, to make it look a little bit more close, a little bit closer to uh, conventional um, approach, even though um, that may um, doing so may sacrifice some of the internal validity that we we, we value here. Um, about the um, <clears throat> infant mortality issues in um, in the in the model. Actually, without infant mortality, the relationship between fertility and democracy becomes stronger. Um, and um, also, um, I think we tried excluding infant mortality 
uh, in the main models as well. And, and the results uh, are actually stronger. Um, <clears throat> what the, the reason why we, we think this, this belongs to uh, our model is that we, we need to satisfy this conditional ignorability assumption that, that the uh, fertility rate needs to be, I mean, has to be plausibly conditionally ignorable, that, that the um, <clears throat> other variables cannot predict um, the fertility rate. And we, we know that this is not a natural experiment. We know that this is not a, com a completely um, exogenous variable, but we need to include uh, variables that, we, um, <clears throat> that are associated with infant mortality, uh, with fertility rate in order to satisfy this, this assumption. It, perhaps we should make that uh, point clearer. Um, or perhaps we should include um, <clears throat> robustness table that, that shows uh, the results without infant mortality rate. This is something that we, we've never thought about. Um, <clears throat> about uh, uh, several points uh, uh, made by Gabriel um, about the, uh, the effect, the, the lag, the effect. Um, we also thought about including 10 year lag or 20 year lag, or maybe even 30 year lag uh, of fertility rate. Um, perhaps that would help us with, um, <clears throat> deal with the uh, reverse causality issues. Um, but uh, doing so will, uh, will necessarily, um, you know, we, we're gonna lose a lot of observations and then we're gonna be even further away from standard approach uh, that would look uh, at longer time period. We were already looking at a uh, period after 1960, uh, which is a bit non-standard in, in the conflict literature. But uh, yeah, we, we will give uh, some serious thoughts to that. Um, and about the effect, possible effect of uh, fertility rate on population, we do talk a little bit about the youth bulge, but uh, we kind of, do it maybe in, in passing. Maybe we should uh, deal with this uh, head on um, in the next uh, uh, revisions of, of our paper. Um, right, um, about the, uh, the possible effect of fertility rate on civil conflict, which may in turn influence in, uh, international conflict. Um, I guess we didn't mention that, uh, we, we didn't discuss that uh, this issue at all in, in the paper. So I think um, we're gonna, um, we're gonna address this issue. I think we, we're gonna have to address this issue uh, in, in the next round of, of revisions. Uh, so thank you for bringing that up. Um, about the, the, you know, what, what explains this, um, this observed relationship? Uh, it's also something that we decided not to include in the, in the paper. You know, ultimately what, what, what explains the democratic peace? We, we don't answer that question uh, because that's not the purpose, but, um, um, Perhaps there is a way to um, make some discussion to uh, to make to make our paper more appealing. Um, yeah, Eric, do you have anything that you want to add? Uh, yes, briefly. Thank you very much to all the uh, commenters. Uh, I think you've done us a great service, an enormous service. Uh, so thank you. Um, they're mowing my lawn, so I'll try to keep this really quick. Um, so I think, you know, this points to a basic fundamental problem that we have, which is we're trying to do something that's difficult and complicated. And there are a lot of moving parts when you, you know, do open heart surgery on social science. And uh, there's no way for us to solve every potential problem. There's no way that we're going to empirically get to the point where uh, everyone out in the community goes, yeah, no, that's right. Um, what we can do is we can make a, a, our best effort at doing a good job, but really I think we might want to step back a little bit and sort of start with a, a more basic point, which I think is less controversial. In fact, this is one of the paradoxes, you know, Andy's point was kind of sort of, um, there are reasons to believe that you, you, you might be wrong. Okay. But also that we already know this and, um, uh, and, and that's the kind of reaction, the flavor of reaction that I, I see is that, well, on the one hand, if we already know this, why isn't it the way people do things? On the other hand, yeah, no, absolutely. Our iteration of it could be wrong. So what we really need to do is to sell the idea that if you accept that democracy comes from somewhere and that the things that cause democracy might well be in the mix of what causes interstate cooperation, then 
you need to approach it that way. And you can't just assume that um, democracy is having the effect that we see in single stage models, that, that it captures everything, that that might be a misspecification. Now, the way we go about it might be flawed, but we can show a way to go about it in which you have this interesting change in the results. And that should stimulate um, a big conversation in the literature where others do it better and do it differently. And, and eventually we come to a consensus about what the effects are, but maybe we can convince people that the pathway is the right one, even if our articulation of it is not perfect. So we've got about 10, 15 minutes. So um, I don't, if there were comments or you know anything anybody wanted to follow up on, uh, just sort of open it up to any discussion that would be useful. Can I jump in? Absolutely. Okay. Oh yeah. Uh, I guess maybe this is due to my me mostly coming from comparative politics. Um, but so to me, reading the paper, I didn't need I didn't need any convincing that you know you can't just regress uh, peace on or you know mids on on uh, democracy status and then call that you know um, an unbiased estimate. So that, like, I, I'm totally on board with with you know your motivation and and that that um, was absolutely clear to me. I think to me the challenge is if you do this, like, as the paper is currently written, you know, you essentially say in the beginning, you know, you can't do this, which I agree with, and then you say, and so we we're doing an instrumental variable model, and so everything else, you know, that comes past this hinges on the instrument, and so I think that's going to be really hard um, just because there is so much skepticism, rightly so, to, towards instruments. It might be the best approach um, to, the, to this problem, but, you know, the big question then becomes, is your instrument valid? And, you know, so it, is it a better estimate than if we don't use an instrument? Um, so I think that's going to make it really difficult to convince, to convince everybody with, with any instrument. Um, I think one question is, and I'm not, I don't know this, enough um but i'm not super familiar with the copula model that you you all are using and so i think to me it was very you know you have like one sentence that we're using this model and the rest is in the appendix and so i think one part could be that a larger part of the paper would also be about introducing this model for this type of problem um, and maybe taking away a little bit from the particular instrument and talking about the general model uh, a little bit more would allow you to kind of, you know, frame it as more of a contribution also from the modeling type, um, and not just on the on the focus on that particular instrument. I would I would add um, on the non contiguous issue. You know, one one way around obviously politically relevant dyads is not terribly helpful. Um, you miss a lot of conflicts that way too. I know Miles has some stuff on that, but you could try using something like the Dielgert's relationship data, which codes for a relationship regardless of conflict. So there's cooperative relationships in there as well. And that then gets you to a subset of what they would say is meaningful interactions between dyads regardless of contiguity. Now contiguity does factor into that, of course, but it, it winnows down the non-contiguous dyads to those that are interacting in a meaningful political way, um, wh whether that's conflict or cooperation. And it could be one subsample to try. Okay. Um, yeah. I think, I think at, at this point, we're probably like less concerned about generalizability of the finding and concerned more about the internal uh, validity of, 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 of the finding. So we don't, we do not care as much about you know capturing all the conflicts that have happened. Uh, we're, we're happy to accept that we are explaining a subset of the conflict as long as we we uh, make sure that our our, our inference is uh, is based on a sound uh, sound logic. But uh, but um, um, I I didn't um, I haven't tried a lot of other ways to make a subset. Uh, uh, but if that, that gives us a way to, uh, to appeal to a broader audience, I, I think we should, we should try this. Um, <clears throat> about the, 
uh, what was it? Right, about um, um, the plausibility of the instrument, I, I agree with Florian that this is uh, the, the, the key and this is the most um, critical part um, <clears throat> of the paper. Um, one of the criticisms that we, we've been receiving a lot is, is about uh, the direction of causal arrow between fertility rate and, and democracy. Um, <clears throat> We argue that fertility rate influences democracy and not, um, um, and not the other way around. Um, <clears throat> but uh, uh, some people say that you know, this is uh, bi at least bi-directional or maybe just reverse causality democracy uh, would cause uh, fertility rate. Um, <clears throat> so my question to, to you is that uh, do, do you, um, would you would you find it more plausible if we um, frame our argument as, as bi-directional relationship um, rather than the like unidirectional uh, relationship between fertility rate and, and, and democracy? I mean, um, as far as uh, statistical um, identification is concerned, it's, it's fine if, if this is just a correlation. It doesn't have to be a causation. It's just that we lose uh, um, a way to we lose a natural experiment interpretation. We can no longer interpret this as a natural uh, natural experiment if if it's bidirectional. Um, but you know if if that um, if you would find it more plausible, um, then maybe maybe we should um, <clears throat> change the pitch. I don't know, to me, uh, honestly, it doesn't matter. Uh, like for me, for me, the big, you know, I believe the relevance of the instrument. Uh, for me, the big part is the exclusion restriction. Um, that's kind of the one which I have the most trouble with. So that's, I don't know, it's hard for me to answer that question because I don't, um, I don't have that, that problem. Okay, all right. So, I, so coming from a so economic history background, the relationship between fertility and democracy seemed quite natural to me, actually, because there's this whole literature on how there's a fertility transition in Western Europe was one of the drivers of, of growth and political development hundreds of years later. So I, I, I mean, it's, it's, I guess it will depend on you know, the background of your referees, but to me, it seemed like a perfectly natural assumption uh, to, to start with. And, and I thought the mechanism made sense as well. I mean, in terms of the exclusion restriction, I, I think, you know, I, I've done some work with IV and people always question the exclusion restriction. And I found that people now are writing papers where they say, well, Assume that you take, you know, that you're satisfied by the exclusion restriction. Let's kind of move on. It's almost kind of acknowledging that there's a subset of the population out there that are never going to be convinced by your argument. And then you can kind of start having a conversation, you know, with, with, with the rest of the population. Uh, I think the, the other kind of way around it to some extent is, is what you do with late. Because I think by, I mean, it, by almost claiming that your results are a bit more specific, then you allow people who are maybe not inclined to believe the results to be able to sign off on them. Because then they'll say, okay, sure, but you know, there, there's still another subset of cases where you know the results that we like to believe there are, are, are still the case. I mean, maybe this is just a little bit too cynical, but it, it's, it's sort of what I've seen. So reading actually, uh, was doing this quite recently, just reading papers that use IV to try and see how they deal with potential criticisms of the exclusion restriction. And sometimes actually they basically say, well, you know, it is possible that the, this exclusion restriction is not being satisfied because of, of this criticism, but it's the best that we can do because the option is that we just, you know, run a regression that's not well identified. So somewhat related to that point, one of the things I found myself wondering is kind of what would non-fertility 
rate induced democracies affects B, right? And so that's really kind of where you're getting, this kind of ties into the point is, you know, what would another instrument kind of, what would the effects be? And so do you have a reason to think like that this effect is unrepresented or not, right? And so I was kind of trying to think about what alternative instruments would be um, that would induce a different effect. And I can't, I didn't really come up with anything. Like it's not clear to me why we should expect this result to be unrepresentative in expectation. Um, and I think that that could potentially kind of, you know, help you, you know, sidestep some critiques. Right. So to, that's a good point. To, oh, sorry. Oh, no, no, no. no. To draw on the, these comments that are sort of about the, the generality of the result, you may also want to just mention in the paper that it is not the case that the existing results are, uh, are indicative of an average treatment effect, right? So if you believe that the effect of democracy is heterogeneous, then, you know, there's this, what OLS is picking up on is this treatment variance weighted average, right? There's this Aronov and Sammy paper. I mean, this is, this is in mostly harm, harmless econometrics, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so, you know, to, that may be a way to deal with that line of criticism if, if that comes up, you know, which is that it's also not the case that the existing body of research necessarily represents an average, you know, anything close to an average treatment effect. Um, but where you can come in is that you can be quite specific about what the effect you're picking up on is. And that, you know, that does open the door to sort of teasing out the mechanisms. That's a good point. Okay, so we've got just a couple of minutes left. So uh, Dinah, Eric, uh, any any last thoughts? Um, Again, I wanna thank um, the commentaries that, that, that they're, they're very incisive and detailed and give us a lot to work with. Um, I think, you know, one of the fantasies that I've had for a long time about our community is that we would, consider the review process, a process for the very kind of discussion we're having right here. That publishing doesn't mean you're right. It means that you say something that provokes others to do interesting work, that it has a, an effect on the accumulation of knowledge. But I don't think that's where the community is right now, especially not in certain uh, substantive areas. And so the danger that we face is that we're going to die a death of a thousand cuts with this piece that reviewers well there's just so many surfaces that that are available to quibble over that at the end of the day you know you can write a two-page review that says close but not good enough and uh so one possibility is that we consider something outside of the community like in economics or something like that where uh it will be treated more on its face in terms of a, uh, the the methodological content of the work and you know, maybe there's a toehold in, in that way. Thank you. All right, if there's, uh, if there's no last thoughts, we're at 11. Um, so we'll, we'll cut it off, uh, cut it off for this, this session. I wanna thank Dinah and Eric for sharing this really nice work. Um, I look forward to seeing it out and hopefully, you know, ho hopefully, hopefully soon. Um, well, thank you. I, I'd like to thank you all for, for giving us a lot to think about. Um, thank you very much. Um, yeah, and, and I'll also, yeah, I'll, I'll echo that. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the panelists. Really great feedback. Um, thanks, Jeff, Florian, Gabriel, Andy, um, for, for helping us out. So uh, thank you all who've been tuning in live. If you're watching this later, um, our next our next session is looks like we're we're nailing down the time, but it looks like it is going to be November thirteenth. We're going to try to thread the needle and have a session during the lunch break of the virtual peace science meeting. So you should be getting a uh, should be getting an, an email about that. We're going to have uh, Noam Reich, uh, who's a graduate student at Princeton. He's going to be presenting a paper called "Do States Screen or Signal?" And I'm looking forward looking forward to having that discussion. So um, until next time, signing off. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you.